TG Tuesday live without a net with Tony Greer. Tony, welcome to the show. Slash Bennington, what's happening, man? How are you? I'm good, man. It's always good to have you back. I look forward to these. It's great to be here with oil on the highs, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. Talking of which, jump in. We were talking a little bit off camera. What's on your mind right now? Well, I feel like we are in the middle of the nonlinear inflation trade, right? You're going to have, um, you know, momentum players like me piling into the natural resources space. And you're going to have central bankers like Jerome Powell saying that, you know, just relax, everybody. This inflation that you see on the screens is transitory with no with no academic background behind that whatsoever. And so what I kind of see developing, Ash, is a battle of the transitory inflation fed versus the narrative of the sort of transitory my ass group right if you will which includes by the way paul tudor jones now jamie diamond jeremy weir the ceo of trafigura the biggest commodity merchant in the country in the world yep. and so that is sort of a side of the trade that i am not going to fade i'm not going to fade the side with jamie diamond paul tudor jones and the trafigura ceo um rather listen to what they have to say Right. So if we listen to Jeremy Weir, um, you know, who no relation to Bob, by the way, who said made five re really important points at the FT Global Commodities Summit. Right. Number one, commodity prices likely to stay high for a decade. Right. That's impactful from a CEO. Number two, they see increasing demand for commodities, especially metals. So we've been looking in the right place. They're saying that the green movement is going to require more production, which is a theme we've pre pre discussed here. Excuse right. me. Um, oil prices rising on carbon costs and also inflation, further themes. And the last point he makes is he acknowledges that we're really nowhere near full electronification of vehicles. So, you know, I think that those things are resonating in my mind. And it's just about surfing the positioning in commodities and stocks right now. It really is. Yeah. You know, I'm listening to what you say, and I'm thinking this all through, and I'm processing it. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting to me. And I don't want to sort of diminish the academic viewpoint here, because it's a very important viewpoint to bring to the table. But for me, if I've got folks with PhDs on one side, and guys who have positions on on the other, I'm probably with you watching the tape and seeing what the guys who have positions on are thinking. And when you say, you know, the electronification of, of, of cars is nowhere here, you know, it's important to hear that coming from a CEO, someone who's looked at it. Another way to come to the same conclusion would be to walk into your garage or to walk down the street and see what the predominance of the cars are actually running on, right? So it's almost yeah. like this common sense, you know, look at the tape versus the academic. And I'm not diminishing that because it is an important perspective. But when yeah. those two come into conflict, yeah, you know, we're in the same camp. We want to listen to the practical user, right? The person who is, you know, theoretically in the trenches trying to procure and maybe offload commodities. And he's getting a really, really good sense. He's a guy that's speaking to clients. He's a guy that is speaking to, you know, merchants of every commodity from metals to energy to grains. And I just trust that person's opinion. And then, of course, Ash, we've got the great calibration to reality where the data comes out today. And we've got the right. biggest month over month, you know, 12 percent increase. Um, excuse me. We've got the biggest month over month inflation number that we've had maybe ever at 6.6 percent, I believe it was for May. So, you know, the, the inflation picture has clearly perked up since the Biden administration sort of got in gear here with the several several moves that they've made in the energy patch that you know about. No need to beat the dead horse there. Um, but that's got oil on the run. And to me, what's interesting, oil is probably a better buy at $70 than it was at $35, quite honestly. You know, um, I, I think that we're seeing, you know, what we're seeing in the spreads is relevant. Spreads are widening. That backwardation is there, and it feels like it's here to stay. Um, the entire crude oil calendar just expanded from a four-dollar item in May to a six and a half-dollar item in June. That's all of the spreads in between widening out, and you know, it feels to me like OPEC Plus. No matter what the narrative. They're doing a great job of allowing the oil markets to rise, given the amount of production cuts that they are keeping on. And that's that that oil move right there is a critical move that I'm not fading. That oil move has not buckled at all in the last several days, where a few other components of the inflation trade have. Yeah. I'm looking right now at uh, WTI, about 72 in the cash markets. Explain the significance of 
the futures on this because it's such an important point. And very often the, the things that go without being said are the most important. You're a true expert in this space. Break that down for us, walk us through. Yeah, so we're talking about backwardation, Ash, right? That is when the front of the commodity curve becomes the dearest part of the commodity curve, the most expensive part, the highest in price. That is generally caused from tightening supplies where people that are using the oil are trying to wait till the last minute that they can to purchase the oil because there has been such a shortage, right? It's difficult to get your hands on. There's not a lot in storage right now. So what you've got is the spreads that trade from calendar month to calendar month widening out in a backward dated scenario where the front month is higher than the next month. If you look at the entire curve of the whole entire year, for example, of the crude calendar, it looks very much like a vertical line from the top left to the bottom right of your screen. And that's indicative of the front month commodity of the front month oil contracts being more valuable than the back months right now. And that is, um, sort of by design what happens when you've got tightness in supply. Yeah, right, this is wait. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say this, of course, is in, in contradistinction from contango, uh, the reverse, uh, which is what we saw uh, a few months ago, the super contango positioning that we had in those contracts. That's right. We had the exact opposite go on. We had people forced to pay other merchants to take oil off of their hands. And that's why we went into negative territory briefly over a year ago, something that I am almost per positive we'll never see again. And I don't like to say never, but this is one of those things that that was really a once in a lifetime deal, I think. Um, so where we are now, we're coming out, we've got increasing demand growth, we've got a tightening market, and the price on the screen over my left hand shoulder does not lie. And it continues to put on, you know, weekly new highs pretty much every time to turn around. So this, this is one sector. Um, of the inflation trade that's intact. And I think we should probably just address the ones that are not right now, Ash, right? Because we are surfing this inflation trade. I remain bullish. I remain on the side of the you know gentlemen that are looking for extended lasting inflation rather than transitory. So what we've got is we've got things going on like China doing some saber rattling about the commodity rally, literally threatening to sell some base metals over a period of time. That has taken the bloom off the base metal rows for now. It's got LME copper back below 10K. Creates a little bit of a tricky technical scenario where copper may have this sort of false breakout to a new high at the top of the uh, move right now if prices continue to retreat. But I'm more in the camp that they're going to stabilize, find a level where even China becomes a buyer. And next thing you know, the rally gets on its feet again. So with the move in copper, I really think that it's very much a reflection of a couple of things. Number one, we've got the FOMC tomorrow, right? All metals traders have got to be on guard. Um, and number two, we've got the dollar index rallying to massive resistance levels right now. That is causing a little bit of weight on the commodity complex. So I think that stuff is all part of the trade. Uh, that's stuff that we can navigate and you know continue to stay on the bull side of the inflation trade and just understand that it will not be a linear path to get there. Yeah, and to your point on the dollar, uh, DXY, the Dixie right now, uh, trading at almost, uh, well, 90 spot 52, continuing to roll down all year. Uh, looked like coming into this, uh, well, I've got crappy data here, but it looks like it's dropped uh, It's dropped considerably since the beginning of the year. You're exactly right, and it's what, what has happened, you know, it, it has fallen to as low as an 89 handle, Ash, where, you know, everybody's looking for it to curl over. It hasn't curled over yet. So what happens is we have a short covering rally. Very simple. Now we're up at resistance at areas and across a couple of different commodity, excuse me, a couple of different currency crosses um, that I think can fail here. So I'm looking for the dollar to fail and commodities to get back on their horse again. And I think that there, there are a couple of commodities well set up to do that. I've seen, you know, the grain markets. Other base metals like aluminum and zinc are right into support zones here. So for me, following this trade, it looks like we should be in a period where the dollar index starts to fade, the precious um, metals start to pick up again, and the inflation trade gets going. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Tony, I'm curious, what do you uh, have in your mind if you have any key price levels on the dollar uh, on DXY? Great point, Ash. You know, as a trader, we have to be prepared for when things go opposite of what we're preparing for. So. If the dollar index gets, say, above 
91, I think that's the first set of moving average resistance levels. And then 91 and a half is sort of the make or break, uh, the sort of last ditch effort. I think that's the 100 day moving average up above the markets. So you start getting above 91, 91 and a half in the dollar index, which is about a big figure higher from here. You know, you start to have my attention in terms of not necessarily the inflation trade backing off, but the commodity trade just might be backing off where we may see these physical prices of commodities that have been, you know, almost parabolic for a year now. I don't want to be parabolic because it seems a little dramatic. They haven't been parabolic for a year, but they've really been straight up off of the March lows with very little of a dip to get your to be able to get your hands on these trades. So, you know, that's how we're trying to surf it, Ash. And I feel like we've got the timing right. Uh, for the dollar to fail at these levels. Um, you know, it's really interesting to see, for me, the Federal Reserve out there, you know, bucking the commodity move, saying this move is transitory. Mm. Shortly after they say it, there's a really inexplicable bond market rally that just really knocks yields right back from the 160s in the 10-year down into the 140s. And when you look at that market now with, the 10 year yields off the highs and gold off the highs, it makes the Fed look a lot smarter, right? It makes you say for a moment, oh, yeah, that, you know, it kind of is inflationary. That inflation is kind of transitory, right? Like gold is back off of its highs, the bond market is off of its lows. And so there must be more to it. The, the Fed must have something sort of right about that idea. And yeah. so that's the part of this, that, that's where we are in the trade right now, um, you know, sort of playing defense, respecting what's going on in the macro world, and having a plan no matter what happens. Looks like gold uh, right now spot at uh, 1,858, uh, and U.S. Treasury yields, again, uh, you know, flirting back and forth with uh, 150 bips right now at uh, 1.494. Curious, to get back to the dollar story, do you have any price levels on the downside that you see as a target or as a resistance level? Well, I'm more, yeah, no, I'm following you, Ash. I think, you know, my, the dollar for me is my speedometer in the commodity trade. Mm -hmm. So when the dollar is rallying and bouncing like it is, that's when I want to, you know, very carefully adjust my commodity positions, right? I may get out of the way of some of the metal stocks that I think can fall, but I want to position myself, for example, right now to buy gold on this dip while the market isn't pricing in a lot of headline inflation that we're seeing, right? feels like gold positioning may have gotten a little bit ahead of itself up at 1900. If the Federal Reserve takes the bloom off the inflation rose a little bit, gold backs off. I understand that. What's interesting now is that if you draw the downtrend line that gold was following while the ETF assets were falling from 110 million ounces to 100 million ounces, you connect that set of tops. And what gold has done is broken through that trend line and pulled back. Right. And that's where we are now at 1850, Ash. We are into the pullback zone. We are into huge support above the moving averages. We are into support back to that breakout trend line. And I think that gold is going to hold here and work its way higher over time. Yeah. I'm curious. You also mentioned grain, something that I don't follow closely. Give us a little bit of context on that, why you follow it, why it's significant, and what you're looking at. Well, you know, the the grains are a little bit of a scary discussion, right? Because the grains are the intersection of your grocery bill and this sort of heavy duty macro work that we're doing here, looking at charts, following the Federal Reserve, watching these commodities absolutely pick up and rally um, because of demand and some shortages, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, that's sort of why you have to be cognizant of what's going on in grains, Ash, because next thing you know, you'll walk out of the grocery store and your loaf of bread will be $14 and your cereal will be $22 and you'll be wondering how you bought two items and spent 50 bucks, right? Yeah. It'll, be, it'll be that kind of thing. And, you know, this is, this is the problem. Um, this is a major problem for the lower to middle class as we get grinded between the gears of inflation and taxation. Um, the only thing that we can do is make moves as players in the market, and that's why we're following the grain trade, right? So we see grains break out of a 10-year bear market, right? Very easy to chart on the on charts. You pick up the uh, Bloomberg Commodities Grain Subindex and chart it over 15 years or so. You will see the last 10 have been straight down across wheat, corn, and beans. Now, 
A lot of that has to do, you know, smaller demand, massive supply, great ops, a lot of technology comes into play there, and some longer stories than that. But now, as the grains turn and start to rally, we've got a huge buyer in China, we've got huge buyers in India, we've got lousy uh, excuse me, crop supply down in Brazil, we've got tough weather conditions up here in the U.S. for a good harvest, and what does that do? That means that the harvest that's going to come out the other side is going to be maybe a little bit smaller, a little more, a little less, um, maybe a little more damaged than expected and not a tremendous crop yield. So when you get that and you've got these merchants clamoring for corn and for wheat and for all the other grains to put into their food, you are going to see those higher grain costs get passed right off to you and I, the consumer. So what I've chosen to do is try to get my clients into you know, structural ETFs that can be a hedge to that type of price action at the grocery store, where you can kind of get long DBA, which is a agricultural commodity ETF, for example, that includes the grains, and try to hedge your exposure a little bit that way. But I think that is, uh, you know, that that's the real danger of the grain rally is where it meets your wallet. And that's unfortunately something that we're all going to be contending with it for you know, certainly the near term, quite possibly the long term, meaning, you know, maybe five years to a decade if Paul Tudor Jones, Jamie Dimon and the Trafigura CEO are right. Yeah, I'm getting doubly whacked, Tony, as a New York City bachelor. I literally never cook. Right. So what we've seen is actually it's the, it's the tightness in the labor market in addition to the rising cost of commodities. So what's happening is the price of prepared foods, restaurants, takeout, delivery are outstripping even the price rises that we're seeing in the underlying commodities. So I'm getting I'm getting hammered. So you're ordering from TGI Fridays and getting your burger for 36 bucks plus tax. You feel that you feel like you have to tip them even though you went to pick it up, right? The whole thing. I had a $38 plate of marinara the other night. Oh, God. like completely See, this, insane. You got to get into you got to get into DBA before the thing doubles. <laughs> and your and your pasta is 60 bucks. I mean it's like completely insane. It's no meat yeah. in the sauce. It's literally just marinara. That's 38 right. bucks. Yeah, we're going to see, you know, uh, man, Ash, you know, this is just the beginning, okay, right? Like, and timestamp me if I'm wrong, because I would be delighted to be wrong about this one thing, this right. one trade, right? Inflation, as we know, is good for nobody, right? It's good for nobody except the global elite, right, who've got the money to pay for everything. The way the world looks now, I don't think we need to favor the global elite any more than we have been lately. So, you know, we're, we're looking for a win for the little guy here. And that's really tough to come by when inflation is persisting the way it is. Yeah. Tony, I want to be fair to all sides here. I want to at least make sure that we make the case so that people understand what the argument on the opposite side is that the Fed is putting forth. This idea uh, of transitory inflation is I basically understand it. Uh, the Fed's view uh, is that this is about uh, the reopening, this sort of spike upward that's caused by the reopening. And there's a little bit of a mismatch in supply and demand uh, that's caused by some of these transitory factors. And as a consequence, in that view, making that argument, not saying it's right, but just explaining that argument, that those transitory factors will eventually subside and the rate of inflation will slow down. Is that pretty close to your understanding as well? That's their argument, Ash, you know, and, and if you want to take a look at the last, you know, five or 10 years, you can see where they get it, right? You can see where, you know, technology has been a tremendously deflationary force in markets, right? In the last, especially five to 10 years, you know, you're, you're, you've, we've seen other deflationary forces in the markets like U.S. humongous debt load, right? You know, debt servicing is obviously a deflationary event because it's taking spendable money out of their pocket. So, you know, I understand that the Federal Reserve and many others have this view um, that we are in a period that we head back into a deflationary scenario. Now, I can listen to that and acknowledge that and say, OK, I respectfully disagree and I'm looking the other way because nothing about my commodity performance charts has told me that this is letting up at all. And then when you see commodities breaking out technically to new highs and to blue sky trading levels, I call it, where there's really not much resistance, you know, you get a little nervous about where some of these prices can go. So I understand the I understand that, you know, shorting the bond market, looking for higher yields has been the widow maker for a long time. Right. Ed Harrison's referred to it very smartly that way. And it has been, um, you know, I, I want to be in the camp the year after the Fed doubles its balance sheet that says that this is going to last a little bit longer than it has in the past, this inflationary episode. So 
with the velocity of money, with with money growth where it is, I don't know how there's another way out of this once the economy gets back going again. Um, I don't see what is going to slow down the inflationary trade right now. I really don't, other than potentially the Federal Reserve trying to keep yields and gold at bay to try to make it look like the market has no concerns about inflation. So that, that, that's what they're able to accomplish and what the battle of the inflation bull has to fight, if that's fair. Can't hear you. Oh, there we go. Sorry there about that. You know, I, um, I was just talking yesterday with Ed about that 40-year chart going back to 1981. On uh, It's the uh, DSG-10 chart at the FRED uh, database at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. You look at that roll down from basically uh, nearly 16% in September of 81 uh, down to what basically uh, bottomed out around uh, July of 2020, about a year ago, and just put, make your point right for you. Boy, that has been the widow maker trade. If you were secularly against uh, the idea of rates falling, you just got hammered. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we had the bout with rates looking at potentially negative territory and some of the right. shorter term bond instruments. You know, like that. That is a that is a bond bull market that is a force to be reckoned with. And quite honestly, why I try not to play in the bond market, rather use it as a barometer that's telling me what the market wants to do. Yeah. The counter case, of course, is driving while looking in the rearview mirror is always a dangerous activity. Uh, and that you could come away with that with this thought, like, you know, things are don't, you know, rates don't go, uh, rates don't go up until they do. And if you think of zero as a real bound, by the way, the European Central Bank doesn't seem to share that view. But if you do think of rates as bounded at zero, there really is only one way to go. Yeah, that is a way to look at it, Ash. You know, I'm, I'm going to put I'm going to put a lot more weight in the fact that we've got a different administration that is pulling vastly different strings in the market, causing vastly different things to go on that, you know, I'm not going to ignore, like spiking the price of gasoline. Um, you know, if these are the things that the new administration is actively working on, then we are in for a long next three years, because, you know, once this gets going, it's impossible to put the genie back in the bottle once there are shortages of commodities, difficult circumstances to produce or deliver those commodities, and any kind of a increasing demand for those commodities while the shortages exist. So that's what I'm positioned for, Ash, and I would love to see the Federal Reserve you know, get the nation out of this predicament that we're in right now. But I'm going to continue hedging this predicament until the trade absolutely destroys me because it feels like this is the one that's playing out. Yeah. Man, time flies while you're having fun. I just looked at the clock. We've like, I thought these were our introductory remarks. We've blown through like half the show. So we should jump in and hit some of these questions uh, coming up. Uh, TG, what do you think is spanking metals right now? Could it be the big banks? A little bit of context on this. Uh, copper uh, specifically is at, I think, eight week lows, dropping four. Uh, looks like 4.1% on the day alone. Fair question, right? Um, I mentioned in just earlier, the Chinese are addressing the commodity rally. They've made a comment that they would be selling um, to kind of time, uh, time splice selling um, certain small amounts of copper, aluminum, and zinc. I think that's relevant. I think it's relevant that we kind of are backing off in fairness in the metals trade from the dead ball high of the trade. <laughs> Right. If you look at, for example, the London Metals Exchange Index, the LMEX, that is a you know index of five base metals or so, including iron ore, that thing hasn't broken trend at all. Right. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel like what we're seeing now is the different metals adjusting because of positioning and because of the Federal Reserve tomorrow, quite honestly, um, ahead of that and getting set for the next run. And so that's what I think is going to happen in copper. But it does make sense to me that it's backed off the highs. Yeah, I'm looking at that chart now. Absolutely right. No sense of bucking the trend at all. No, no, it's still very much intact. Yeah. Uh, by the way, let me ask, any chance you want to speculate on tomorrow? Oh, on the rate, on the yields? No, man. I sit back with popcorn. I let the market react. And then once the market's done reacting, I say, OK, how did I do here? And let's proceed. Yeah, that's one of the things that I really enjoy about talking to you, Tony. It's just like, it's the tape, man. Why, why am I going to speculate about the future when I can actually look at what's happened? Exactly. We can just look at what happened and, and, and adjust accordingly. So it doesn't make sense to trade in the dark here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, by the way, I should say, I think that last uh, question came to us from, I think it was LC. Um, 
here's one. This is just a comment from RR, but I think this is a point that's well taken. I was looking at this something that was earlier today, uh, which is the retail sales number on the day uh, fell. I think it was uh, 1.4 or so percent for May. Uh, obviously, a little bit of a counter trend there. Something significant, something you think about, or just something that you believe is uh, noise in the data? Well, the retail sales data is just that, Ash. It's data. The data is going to beat. The data is going to miss. And what I'm into is the fact that retail, the sector, is still, I think, the top performing sector year to date in in uh, equities. So you know, I I think while there may be some you know seasonal or temporary weakness in retail sales, I feel like the consumer somehow is still in okay shape coming out of the lockdown. Right, either if it's by forced savings somehow, or the fact that you know some of the other supporting data that we've seen about the economy and even about retail sales numbers has not been all that bad over the last couple of months. It's all been pretty positive. So I don't really let retail sales data slow me down too much. Yeah, let me restate that number. It's actually uh, off 1.3%, not 1.4%. Uh, and, you know, does it really matter if we're talking about data, right? Uh, I mean, it's a monthly series, right? These things bounce it's around. It's what they do. Yeah. Uh, so here's one that comes just from Brandon. It's a little bit of a technical question, but let me just sort of simplify. Uh, he wants to know what your thoughts are about Bitcoin. Any thoughts on Bitcoin we, since we've talked over the last two weeks? Yeah, well, Bitcoin is, I want to just speak, you know, calmly and straightforward about it. It is retracing to a massive resistance level off of the $30,000 lows, right? It's gotten a couple of positive headlines this week. Um, you know, what I what I see, though, is a terrible bear trap unfolding in Bitcoin. I really do. And maybe because I'm a little bit of a tech slash Bitcoin bear from these levels. But with as significant a breakdown as Bitcoin has had down through the 200 day moving average down to 30 K. Right now, we're going to have a big, big retracement rally because this is Bitcoin and the retracement rally is going to be more batshit crazy than anything that we've seen. What it's probably going to do, the way that I see these guys looking at the market, is right. A lot, the Bitcoin community seems to be really milestone driven. Now that it's above 40K, I think you're going to see a lot of people waving in and getting longer. And I just fear that between 42K and 44K, where the big moving averages lie above the markets, I have a feeling that it's going to fail there the first time. And potentially rinse the buyers that have come in here above 40k as of late, because I don't think Bitcoin is ready to be bought yet. And I'm really, I'm only talking from a technical perspective, looking at the chart. I'm not talking about fundamentals. Clearly, Bitcoin has elbowed its way into the macro picture as an inflation hedge, and that is something that I am not going to deny. I just may not be trading it at the time being. Yeah, bear traps, we should say, are, are false signals that lull bears into believing that there's going to be a decline in price when, in fact, the price action is bullish. Did I get that right? I think I got that right. Yes, and I might have gotten it backwards. I think that we are in a Bitcoin bull trap up here where it reels in a lot of bulls and then disappoints them. So excuse me if I said that wrong. I think I may have. Interesting. Interesting. You know, I, yeah. Now that we're above the 40,000 level, especially where there's so much retail participation, we know that there are all of these, uh, you know, sort of psychological, economic, uh, behavioral economic factors where people see those numbers uh, that end in three zeros uh, and it pulls them in. And so it's an interesting question whether or not there's real strength there. And really, again, with this asset class that, I, you know, I obviously am incredibly passionate about. But really, what's driving the short term valuation? To me, there are a lot of disputing views about that. Uh, you could talk about stock to flow ratios. There are other ways of thinking about it. Uh, some of what RAL has done is looking at network effects, looking at address creation relative to price. But what's interesting to me is unlike uh, unlike even U.S. equities, which are trading basically relative to price at some level or another, the earnings relative to price, uh, and obviously fixed income instruments, which have very solid streams where you can price the cash flows, still an open question how the pricing in the short and even intermediate term for these assets gets done. There's no cash flow. Yeah, exactly. It's it's you know it, it's the supply and demand game as pure as the driven snow. That just is what it is, right? Yeah. Here's the one that comes to us from uh, Dave the Trader. A great question. What are your thoughts on the status of the financial sector, specifically XLF, uh, with inflation rising? Bullish, extremely bullish financials, right? They are a sector that popped onto my radar a couple months ago. 
Um, they've broken the sector XLF has broken through all time highs. It has been widely coincidental and, and like, you know, you can draw a direct line between when the Treasury yield curve picked up, the break evens picked up and um, it started rallying. Wait, Ash, sorry, I just want to look for this one tidbit. Sorry. So um, what were we just talking about, Ash? I'm going to have to edit this because I just lost my place. We were just talking about uh, we were just talking about XLF and the financial services. Ah, financial. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I'm back up, right back on track. Excuse me. I wanted to. I thought I had a note here that was. Turns out it's not as good a note as I thought. So let me go back to my train of thought. Financials have been rallying very specifically with the rally in um, yields, the widening of the curve, and the rally in break even. So the sort of inflationary measures, right? I think it's really interesting that they were in a consolidation range for the entire lockdown period. And then thereafter, they were in a consolidation range and could not move while rates were pinned at zero coming out of this pandemic episode at the very beginning. And now that yields have widened, I mean, XLF has broken out. What I'm looking for right now, honestly, is I'm waiting for a pullback to that breakout level so I can buy them. But I think that the market is clearly telling you just if you look at the performance and even the earnings of Bank America, Citigroup, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley. I just saw a blurb that Goldman Sachs was the best performing stock in the Dow Jones this year. I mm. mean, you know, the financials seem to be firing on all cylinders coming out of this episode. So, yeah, I want to look for places to go with this rally. I think it's for real. And if yields continue rising, there's still a lot of upside potential for the banks and financials. Tony, what's the underlying fundamentals there? Is that on increasing net interest margins, the bank's ability to make money? Exactly, exactly. When they have a high, when they have higher yields and a wider spread, they have a little bit of wiggle room where at least they can borrow money cheap and lend it out a little bit higher. Um, and usually activity picks up alongside that. So it's really, that's how the fundamentals work as I see it. And there are probably much better experts on financial space than me. Yeah. Here's a nice short one that comes to us from Ralph Humphrey. Uh, any opinion on coffee? I'm not sure you follow it because he's never heard you mention it before. What's your thoughts on coffee? I have none. I have to be honest with you, Ash. Other than, you know, I, I've, I've been charting, the, you know, been charting the softs. Uh, I don't really have a view. I'm just kind of watching to see that they are participating in some way with the commodity rally. Right. Just so that I kind of know that there's not a lead weight inside the commodity basket that I don't know about that can't get off the ground for some reason. But it seems like coffee is going to be susceptible to the same, you know, growing demand, diminishing price, uh, excuse me, diminishing uh, supply because of supply constraints, because of, you know, whatever um, roadblocks, cyber attacks we're in for next. Right. So I, you're not going to get me to get bearish any commodities here. I'm trading from the long side only or I'm flat. Yeah. Uh, softs, of course, for those who don't follow the commodity space, or soft commodities, there's the agricultural commodities and contradistinctions uh, from things like metals. Coffee, sugar, cocoa, if you will. Yes, indeed. Uh, here's one that comes to us from Prius Omega. I think Prius asked this question yesterday, uh, and we didn't get a chance to answer it, so I'm glad he's asked it again today. Uh, any opinion on the continued reverse repo operations? Man, you know, this is the second time around for this bubbling in the reverse repo. And, you know, the, the stories that went around at first were about potentially the Fed rescuing somebody from this repo window, right? It was very sort of conspiratorial. Nobody could really put a, uh, nobody could get a handle on it, right? And I even went out to some of my bond market and money market experts that subscribed to my note asking for explanations of what's going on at the repo window. And even people in the repo markets, and they really, they had very, they had limited explanations other than, you know, there's so much liquidity out there that, you know, at times the Fed is having trouble placing it. And so, you know, the, it, it just gets offered on the cheap. And next thing you know, you've got institutions that are coming up and claiming it. Now, I, I don't have, I don't claim to, to decide that that's the right answer. I'm on, you know, you want to be wary of it because it seems like abnormal behavior. But I really can't put my finger on where the risk in that repo window is going to play out into the markets, right? If there, if there are companies that are looking to, you know, cover short cash positions, you know, then maybe there's a squeeze and a tightness in the money markets. But it doesn't seem like that's the case. It seems like there's plenty of money to be lent. Hey, 
head, and I hope I didn't disappear, disappoint the person asking the question. But I'm having a trouble getting, um, you know, getting a good read on this, what it means, and how it's going to affect markets myself. You know, Tony, one of the slightly concerning things about this for me is that I get that same answer from everyone, people who are in the space. As you said, I remember, what was it, 2019, uh, when the reverse repo market broke down, some news broke. I was out at a dinner. I walked outside, and I was reading through on my cell phone thinking, I didn't just fall off the turnip truck, and this doesn't make any sense to me. Right. It's the same exact thing, Ash. You know, it's one of those things that seems to be closely veiled at the Fed in terms of what going, what's going on at the repo window. You know, they, they continue to paint it as matter of fact, you know, course of business type of activity. And until I see the tremors that it's causing in the markets, like, it, you know, it's a distraction to me. And I don't and I don't mean to say that, that it's a, a bad question or anything, because, right. you know, we're, we're always we're always scrubbing the distractions to see if it's a distraction or if it's a problem for our trade. And when I look at this repo uh, issue, and you know it keeps bumbling up, bigger numbers and bigger numbers at the repo window, and I'm saying, okay, where's the damage being done, right? Like, what market is it crushing on me? It's not crushing stocks, it's not crushing the dollar, you know? And so when I look for things to trade off of it, I don't have any, right? And so I'm gonna just kinda, you know, put that on the noise cancellation policy if I can, yeah. until it clearly starts affecting the moves in the credit markets, and then I'll have to respect it. But right now, I'm not smart enough to figure it out. You know, it's funny. It's only a distraction because the Fed intervenes whenever there's a problem, right? I mean, and that's why you can write it down to zero because there's they're backstopped. There's extra wind. There's extra liquidity. It gets mopped right. up. It seems to be a good story because the number is more ginormous every time. You know, every time we set a new record, and at the same time, like I say, I look around and I can't find the fallout. So, you know, that that to me is kind of, uh, you know, it, it's kind of an enigma to me, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, and maybe something. Uh, we should keep an eye on in the longer term and understand what those instabilities building up beneath the surface are. Yeah, that sounds fair, man. So here's one that comes to us from Jeff. Uh, any thoughts on the European carbon credit markets and do you trade it? Um, I'm still in, a, I have to say this, Ash, I'm still in a process. I've got a stack of papers over here and articles that I have to read on carbon credits. Number one is uh, by Raul, the one that he put out in GMI. Yeah. Um, and I'm definitely going to get to that. So no, I don't. I don't want to speak on that. I will brush up to the point that I'm done and can actually talk about it next week or the or the next time we convene. Because I'm the, what what I am picking up about it is that it is a trade that I should be following, and I'm not there yet, so I'm behind the curve. Yeah, I mean, interesting though that you're looking at it. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, carbon credits is an offshoot of the you know fossil fuel business now, right? We've got Exxon, which just over my shoulder put in a two sigma extension to a new high for the move today, going into the carbon capture and storage business, right? So this is clearly becoming, you know, it's like one of the profit lines now for the fossil fuel company. So whether I like it or not, I have to get some understanding of how they trade. I've noticed that the ticker KRBN very rarely ticks down. So it seems to me like the carbon credit market is something that is uh, almost a time being consistently expanding price, if that's fair to say, where I think that um, meaning you're going to have to pay up a lot more to offload your carbon um, if physical transfer that way, if that's fair to say, meaning, you know, the companies that let out the most carbon are going to have to buy credits to offset that. To me, it looks like those credits are getting more and more expensive. And that's just my rudimentary understanding of it. Yeah, I'm looking right now at my sort of somewhat crappy data here, and it looks like this this data series goes back to uh, goes back to uh, July of 2020, uh, where it started uh, trading at around uh, looks like around 20 bucks, and we're up to about 35 right now for some context uh, on yeah. that. So that's something that we got to get smarter on, and I apologize to the asker of that question that I am not up to speed yet, but I will be in two weeks because I'm through it. Tony, we know you can't know everything. <laughs> exactly, when I know nothing. So, <laughs> yes, that's exactly right, Ash. Yeah. Figure it out from last sale as we go. It is interesting, you know, because it seems like a, your suggestion, and it's, it seems like a reasonable one just at the surface without digging in too deep. This represents an expansion of demand for these credits. Uh, so it's probably not shocking that it has risen uh, more or less steadily from the, from the beginning uh, last summer. But I'm also wondering, you know, whenever you have a sort of a new commodity, even you could say a new class of commodities, a new subclass of commodities coming on, 
Does that mean that the market becomes fragmented? And does that mean there's some opportunities there? It's an interesting question. It is an interesting question. You know, I'm, you know, I'm wondering if we're going to be, you know, trading the fossil fuel stocks or any other companies off of the price of carbon credits. You know, Ash, that could be a scenario right. that I, I could consider where you could start hearing about a company, um, you know, that has this massive carbon offset and has to buy carbon credits to cut it back. And next thing you know, the price of carbon credits gets away from them and it causes some kind of a disruption on their balance sheet. Right. Like, does that sound far fetched or does it sound like I'm going down the right angle there? I don't I'm not even sure yet. It sounds like a really interesting question, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. And we're going to make sure we get that gentleman a better answer. God, I love markets. This is fun getting to do this. Yeah, uh, here's one talking of fun. Here's one that comes from a John Farley. I'm guessing that's our Jack Farley here at at uh, at Real Vision uh, seeing this question coming up. The question is, what about OJ? Any thoughts on orange juice futures? He may have just watched Trading Places over the weekend. That's probably. I, I was going to say I, I um, I'm not even sure that OJ is a component of the DBA ETF that I bought into. Um, no, I have no view on orange juice. Um, I'm not a big consumer of it, and I do understand its place in the food chain. And I would imagine that somehow during some kind of a supply disruption, that the price of orange juice is going to be higher in six months. That's what I think about the price of orange juice. And now, is that just part of the macro picture that you see for the rising softs? Yeah, you know, it's it's part of the macro picture that's kind of being built in, if you ask me. You know, Ash, everything everything about this administration has been, you know, toward pivoting toward the electronic vehicle and the green economy and away from fossil fuels. And at some point, that is going to have tremendous cost. And I think it's going to continue to ripple across the commodity complex. But I think that that's what we're seeing on the screens now, and it's manifesting itself in headline inflation data, part of the reason why I'm in the transitory my ass camp. Yeah, I see a, uh, something here from uh, Maxwell's equations. By the way, I think that's the, the gentleman's name, uh, partial differential equations. I didn't get that far in math, but uh, I think he's making reference to uh, careful with orange juice. Orange juice has been involved in securities lawsuits. He's talking about, of course, the Howey test that we hear so much about uh, right. on, uh, on, the, on the blockchain side now with whether these tokens uh, are securities or not, which is an interesting question. Tony, we have covered more ground on this episode, I think, than we ever have before in terms of individual topics to us, John. So yeah. Speed round. yeah, it was. It was a good long speed round. I think it's right on topic. I think it's right on brand. And, you know, to me, the most important part is deciding what part of that trade that you want to be on, right? The inflation trade is going to be nonlinear. You got to decide if you're in the non-transitory or transitory camp and place your bets. Yeah. Uh, Tony, final thoughts on this. I. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. I was just, you know, going forward, Ash, looking to the rest of this week. I am, you know, I want to see what happens with um, yields, most importantly, and the market based inflation expectations. Now that we've got a record high year over year inflation number on the week, I want to see if they pan out, you know, and close that way this week. Because last week we had yields back off. We had technology get back in the lead. We took a little bit of heat on our natural resources trade. But I think it's temporary, and that's how I'm playing it for now, Rash. Yeah, and we should also say, as we have this conversation here around 5 o'clock uh, on Tuesday, we could be living in a totally different world tomorrow. There's always the possibility we're going to get surprised out of the Fed. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the, all of this kind of alludes to position squaring ahead of that, aside from the oil market. But a lot of the inflation trades backing off of the highs as people getting out of the way in case Jerome Powell comes up with some and he is going to address the inflation question about. I think that could be what it is. Yeah, Tony, extremely well said. Always a pleasure. Looking forward to doing it again soon. Two weeks from now, my man. We'll see you, Slash. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tony. Thanks for watching, everyone, and thanks for participating.